Welcome back, week two, part one, the American system of manufacturing. Last week, in kind of a panic, and in a probably embarrassingly condensed way, I talked about centuries of engineering and reduced it to a few slides to look at the thinking and the skills from a long time ago that parallel what we do in industrial design today. And then in an even shorter amount of time, I looked at what would normally be weeks of information and crammed it into like a heartbeat. We looked at how artisans working in the guild system under the royal patronage structure produced amazing luxury goods but for really exclusive consumers. And then how that system started to change and how the world started to change as monarchies fell, as state-sponsored education replaced the guild system, and as goods began to be made to attract customers as part of their design brief, which required that manufacturing efficiencies start to be considered. So we start to see what I think of as design happening. This week, I want to resume that narrative and relocate to America. And it may seem random and it may seem sort of um, bombastic and American-centric, but there's sort of a perfect storm of coincidences that forced manufacturing innovation to make major advances in America at this time period. And it tells the story more clearly if we just focus on what happened in America. Some of this overlaps class reading and textbooks. I'm gonna try and give it better context. A lot of this also overlaps the sixth grade US history class. I hope this is a little more exciting. There were some really innovative ways of making stuff that developed and advanced in America. And I wanna look at what made that possible. There are multiple factors that allowed some things to happen. One is that these developments were happening away from royalty. So at the time, the colonies reported back to England, but there was a whole ocean in between. And you know what happens when the parents are out of town for the weekend. So there was lots of goofing off happening, lots of experimenting. Also, we didn't have any one religion governing everyone. There was a variety of religions. So as a result, there was at least the opportunity to entertain new ideas and new ways of thinking. In 17th and 18th century in North America, everywhere, but in North America for what we're talking about, everybody lived off the land, farming, agrarian culture, agricultural heritage. Most people made all the things that they had in their homes and all the tools that they used. We also had no guild systems to overcome, so it was pretty easy to think about new ways of making things here. I also just want to put in your heads the idea that People came from Europe to America and found it and settled it, but there were people living here for centuries before that with really refined skill sets. So another thing that's part of this equation, which is not really part of what we're gonna talk about, is how much we learned from native cultures, a lot. So part of what we're looking at is the new nation of America, being people who came from Europe, figuring out manufacturing as an extension of European history but the reason that succeeded also is that there was an innovative spirit and technology and farming know-how that came from native cultures and could be woven into that. So this is multiple uh, experiences being woven together. In any other class, we would spend a lot more time talking about the Native American presence in the story, but this is a class about industrialization. So I'm focusing on the story of how industry took off. But I just want you to remember that it really couldn't have happened without the pre-industrial presences around the world, and in this story with Native Americans. Remember also that the craft process is iterative. If someone's making a kettle and it's not quite right, they'll finish it, sell it to someone, know that it doesn't pour as well as it could, and in the next version, they'll adjust the spout or the handle or any part that wasn't working. So a craftsman introduces evolution into the objects being made. Each one will be a little bit better than the one before because each one is made start to finish there is, as a result, this beautiful marriage of materials and utility and form visible in craft tradition objects. But what there isn't is style. These objects are not designed the way we think of design in stylistic terms. They are functional. And they're extremely beautiful. But that wasn't really a big part of the DNA used to make the object. For example, the wooden bowl at the top of the slide has a crazy assortment of handles, and I don't know exactly what it's for, but I can read the object. It's got handles on the side for carrying. It's got a rotational handle for pouring. 
So I'm imagining you can dip this into a basin of water and carry it and then serve it. It doesn't really matter if I know what it does. The people who made it created it and used this beautiful burl wood, which could make the bowl without cracking, uh, to do what it needed to do for the people who needed it. So these craft objects from this era are combining local need, local resources, skill, and evolution to make these remarkable objects. As a result, the forms of utilitarian objects evolved and then stopped evolving because they arrived at the best marriage of material use and function and then they stayed in that form for really long periods of time with very little change. These are all candle snuffers in a world where all light came from candles, ex extinguishing a candle and trimming the wick was an important activity that we've now given up. Some of them are made out of sheet metal, some are cast, some have been forged, there are different materials here but the overall form is relatively similar because the function was the primary inspiration for what these look like. Where style did enter the equation, in America especially, it was borrowed. We had access to a real wealth of resources, especially wood, but we didn't have a lot of stylistic savvy. So we looked to other people to provide that. And if this were a furniture history class, we would have to stop and look at a lot of pattern books, which were produced so that people could make more elevated objects without having to understand what was involved in the design process. The biggest of these is Thomas Chippendale's The Gentleman and Cabinet Maker's Director, published in 1754, which was full of drawings of furniture that anybody who knew how to make furniture but didn't know how to make stuff pretty could use. And Chippendale is a great example of someone who's famous for his designs rather than for his execution of those designs. All of the objects that make up the Chippendale style are made by other people, but the conceptualization of them and the publishing of them was his. I want to throw at you some information about what was happening in America because it really affects this story. Between 1790 and 1860, the US population went from 4 million to more than 31 million. So population explosion. When that happens, you have also an explosion of need. More people need more stuff. In Europe, there was also population increase, but it was constrained by geography, so it just got denser. In America, part of the idea we developed was that we had the whole continent and we should just keep going west until we filled it up. So it seemed like an endless exercise. The more people we have, the farther we'll go west. It's an ugly story when you think about who already lived there and what we did to them. And this is part of why America is struggling against its own nature today. We are a culture of waste and we are really not very good at changing that. Part of that comes from this idea of Western expansion where there's endless new resources. When you use up the resources in New York, you can move to Pennsylvania. When you use up Pennsylvania, you move westward even farther. In 1803, the existing United States purchased the Louisiana Territory, the yellow part of this map, from France. And that gave access to not only twice as much land and twice as many resources, but also the Port of New Orleans for another trading post with Europe. And that increased the opportunity to move even farther west. In 1865, Horace Greeley wrote the famous words, go west, young man, go west, and grow up with the country. As a result, huge population increase, huge migrations westward. There was a demand for commodities but from all these new people, but there was a severe scarcity of labor. And that's the key element in forcing America to figure out other ways to make stuff. The old school craft traditions where things were made in a slow, iterative, by hand process had to give way to mechanization and mass production to suit the landscape of need. At first, new manufacturing methods took the form of simple division of labor, breaking down a traditional craft into more production-focused systems. So in a craft-based world, the entire shoe is made by one person, or in one place, in one effort. With division of labor, you separate out the tanners from the leather dressers, from the last maker and the heel maker and the shoe maker, and the skill level increases because people are focused on an even smaller task so they get really good at it and the output increases because people can work in a more focused way on the components. This is specialization. And what we saw happen with specialization was the intuitive intelligence of the craftsman gave way to a rational intelligence 
of the mechanic. So the apprentice is out and the manager is in. A new way of doing things. Another factor in the arrival of design for production was considering distribution not as an after effect. I'm not going to make this and then try and find someone to sell it. I'm going to think about who's selling it when I'm making it. The American population began to be spread ever farther westward. And if you wanted to sell things to the residents farther west, you had to invent a system to do that. The American peddler stepped in to fill that need. So the guy in black hovering over everyone is the peddler. He's pulled into town in his cart full of wares and he's trying to sell them to people. When he sold them all, he'd go back to the manufacturing centers, New York, Philadelphia, load up and go west again. As a result, things started to get designed with the peddler in mind. So instead of selling a completely made chair, he might sell bundles of parts and you assemble the chair yourself. Also, we started to see regional styles blurring. Instead of things looking like they were made in one place or another place, they were made in industrial centers in a more generic way so they would suit a broader range of tastes. So considering the distribution, but also the customer's interests and needs, start to flavor the way things are made. We start to see ease of transport as an important influencer in design. So we see knockdown furniture ready to assemble furniture for the first time. The peddler's trade, distributing goods in wheeled wagons, required a scaling up of our infrastructure. And it was such an important part of American commerce at the time that road and turpite construction in the 1820s and 1830s really took off. Again, this was happening globally, but in America in a much more focused way. As consumption in the US developed, and as manufacturers learned how to produce in bigger volumes, the custom-made object gave way to warehoused goods. And that meant that manufacturers had to start predicting fashion and style because they had a warehouse full of stuff they weren't going to sell it in one batch with the peddler. He was going to come back many times and load his cart up again. That stuff might stay in the warehouse for a year. So it better still be interesting in a year. Distribution and design are always tied together. And there are some interesting examples of how design changed for this distribution system. The tinware box is a good example. They were made in industrial centers in a generic black enamel and sent out for sale and then painted locally by consumers with whatever style they wanted. And so an expert in tinware boxes could look at any of these and tell you where they were painted because the subtle varieties of style are regional, but the actual object transcends regionalism. And what happened was some smart manufacturers understood the system and started to take advantage of it. I want to look at Lambert Hitchcock because he's one of the earliest people to do this and because it's really easy to understand an important part of this progress by looking at his work. Hitchcock's factory was in Riverton, Connecticut. It's still there. It's a functioning museum now. And you can see it's right on the water. And that's a big part of the story as well. In the Northeast in America, there are many changes in topography where water goes downhill. And people learned to harness that water. So there was water power readily available in New England. And so here's Lambert Hitchcock's factory built right on the river to allow that to happen. He used water power to operate custom-made machinery that he used to make his furniture. To help you see how important adding water power might be, on the right is an actual treadle lathe from Hitchcock's factory before water power. And on the left is just an image of somebody using one to give you a sense of how that works. While you're already using your hands to use the chisel to carve the piece in shape, you have to have a leg kicking on the treadle to power that lathe. And anyone who's used a lathe, I hope, can understand how much more difficult and dangerous it would be if you've got to have a kicking leg at the same time. So when you remove that whole lower body activity and power that lathe by water and get even constant power, you can really change your output. Hitchcock used local wood. There was lots of wood available in Connecticut at the time. He sold the chairs disassembled as parts and the customer would glue it together. Everyone in America knew how to glue a chair together at the time. And weave the seat out of uh, cattail reeds or rush or you know any sort of thin fiber material which most people also knew how to do. As a result Hitchcock was able to produce and sell 50 chairs a day. That's 15,000 chairs a year. If you think about making a chair start to finish all the parts for one chair and then move on to the next you could never do that. By separating out the manufacturing Hitchcock was able to do this. So that lathe was turning legs. 
The front legs are all the same. They later had the holes drilled in them to become a left leg or a right leg. Another machine was making the back splats. This also allowed subtle variations. You could change the turning pattern and make new legs and create something that looked like a new chair, but was still the same manufacturing process and assembly system. You could change the back splat, completely change the profile of it, but have the joints happen in the same place. And you could have almost endless iterations of different chairs using that same setup. And then these chairs are also stenciled with a, a gold or with colored paint over the black. So you could just keep changing those patterns and get an endless output of different chairs. And that's part of how he was able to sell so many as well. But more than the mere division of labor, it was those standardized parts that made this chair successful. Because it was easy to train people, instead of the guild system where someone would learn the entire art of chair making, any farmhand could come in, be trained in a day to stand there and follow a template. And as a result, you didn't have to waste a lot of time training people. You didn't have to rely on skilled people. As people quit and moved west to find their own wealth, you could replace them quickly. So in a landscape where there was a shortage of labor, removing the skill from your labor was a really important way to make sure you could stay profitable and keep making things. That's why I put Hitchcock first in this conversation. I think he was one of the first people to really understand the peddler, the regional style, the ready to assemble thinking, uh, but then also the component part making. But he wasn't the only one taking on this conversation. Lots of people were doing it. We're going to look at the cotton gin as part of the Industrial Revolution, where it fits as part of the narrative. So I'm not going to talk about it this week, but there are a couple of things about the cotton gin we should know this week. One, we all know Eli Whitney invented it, but actually probably he didn't. I'll talk more about that next week. And two, our patent system in America was very young. He wasn't able to get the patent quickly enough, and he wasn't able to enforce the patent well enough to monetize the cotton gin. And it's just a box of wood, anybody could make one. So he couldn't find a way to make money off of this invention. It ended up changing the world for better and for worse. But for Whitney, it didn't do much right away. So he had to go to a next business venture, try and make some money. And as one does, he turned to arms manufacturing. So I want to put Eli Whitney in the conversation this week, and I want to put his main invention in next week. But the reason we need him in this week is, he's a major player in this step forward in manufacturing. In 1798, Whitney signed a contract with the U.S. government to make 10,000 muskets in two years. That was the largest U.S. government contract at the time, ever. It also was the largest number of muskets anyone agreed to make at once. And it's important to point out that Whitney had never made a gun before, and he didn't have a factory. So it also points out that the U.S. government has a really, really long history of throwing money around. Whitney did not introduce any of the ideas that he was popularizing. What Whitney did do was get a healthy national conversation going about repeat manufacturing, about standardization. It wasn't his idea. It came from France, a pamphlet that he was familiar with about something called the uniformity principle. It hadn't been realized in France. And Whitney saw the need for muskets and the government wealth as an opportunity to explore that system. He wasn't able to cross the finish line and deliver the muskets. In fact, he wasn't really able to cross any finish line. In two years, he hadn't even delivered one gun. But he did popularize the idea of manufacturing that wound up changing everything else. Also, I want to point out it's easy to make fun of the government for wasting money like that. But without government support, private industry could never have taken on the challenge of standardization. The government had the money and the time and the patience and access to multiple manufacturers and developers to get people working together to figure this out. And then private industry could step in and take over and make sure that it worked to generate profit as well. So without the big government money, I don't think we ever would have arrived at standardization. So Whitney's name is thrown around as a really important one in figuring out gun making. In fact, John Hall is the person who should be getting the credit because he was the first person to, to realize standardization. I'm going to do a bad job explaining this because I'm not good at explaining things or even actually understanding them. But at the top I put this equation, which is something that John Hall perfected. If you're making two parts that fit together, you could make each one by hand and make sure they fit. Or you could make one part 
bolt it on your desk there, and then keep making parts that fit it. So if you make part B to fit on A perfectly, then you make part C to fit on A perfectly, B and C will be exactly the same. I should have used different hands for that, but you get the point. That idea of not matching one part to another part, but matching a part to a standard, is what John Hall experimented with. That's the first big step forward in manufacturing, to make a static model. The problem with that is that's really good for one factory, but it can't be shared between factories. It's not good for multiple jobbers. An even better next layer is to use gauges instead of standards, instead of models. A gauge is a template that you use to produce all of the parts and you check the parts against it. You actually need two. You need one that's the standard and one that you use to make parts and then when that wears you can make a new one from the standard. But anyway, we don't need to know too much about that. I'm going to show you some gauges later. If the gauge is wrong, everything you make from it is wrong. So what John Hall realized he needed was gauges but also better math, better measuring tools, better metal to make things out of. He needed some other progress to be able to be more accurate in his manufacturing. And that coincided with a global interest in standards, but in an American interest in realizing some of those standards in manufacturing. And some things were happening in this era that allowed Hall to realize that level of accuracy. Joseph Whitworth introduced what became an internationally recognized universal standard for screw threads in 1841. Before that, every factory made their own screws. You need to screw something together. You need to thread a rod and make a screw. You need to tap a hole and make threads and screw those together. And your screws will be completely different from everyone else's. Suddenly in 1841, everybody could talk about screws with a unified language and use the same standard for those screws. That really changed things. Whitworth also made a micrometer that could measure a millionth of an inch. So our ability to measure was supercharged. Before that, 1 16th of an inch was as accurate as anything could be. So you wouldn't be able to make an accurate gauge without that added level of accuracy in the tool making equipment. The third big step forward involves specialized machinery. Today if you walk through a metal shop, you'll see all sorts of equipment on which you can make anything. At the time that didn't exist. In 1816, we got the milling machine, but there wasn't a Westport factory. There weren't banks of Bridgeport machines. They were all custom made. Every factory sort of made their own. This is one good example. This is a Blanchard lathe. This is a functioning scale model of one, but I think it shows the concept pretty well. The standard is put in on one side. That's been beautifully carved by a highly trained woodworker. And then the machine rotates a feeling drum on that one that corresponds to a cutting drum on the other side and cuts that shape out of a rotating stock. So one beautifully carved rifle stock and endless duplicates of that carved not only not by a craftsman, but not by anyone, just by machine. So what we started to do was put our intelligence in the tools and in the system instead of relying on the intelligence of the craftsperson or the worker. You no longer even need anyone who can carve wood. You just need someone who can put a piece of wood into a machine and press go. With those components in place, John Hall was the first person in America able to realize the concept of interchangeable parts in gun manufacturing. And think why this is good. It's good for assembly. You make binfuls of parts and put them together because all the parts are the same. It's also good for salvage on the battlefield. If your gun jams or breaks, you can find a replacement part. It also extends the life of your equipment because you can buy replacement parts now. In 1824, John Hall was able to satisfy a government contract for 1,000 breech-loading rifles, all with interchangeable parts. So I'm not sure why we remember Whitney for transforming gun making when John Hall was the first person to really do it. And there's one more big step forward that Hall investigated, but someone else actually really perfected. And that's the idea of a reference point or reference surface, a fixed point on every object from which you do all of your operations and measuring. Think about if you're making lots of one part and on each one you position it under the drill. Each one you might be a little bit off. If you make a jig that holds the pieces in place, you just put them in place and drill and you don't have to measure anything. You make your jig accurate. And that requires that you put the pieces in the same way. So you'll always have a reference edge or a reference surface. 
for measuring and for manufacturing. With that fourth component in place, manufacturing was able to completely throw off craft techniques and tip right into the mass manufacturing that we know today. In 1835, Samuel Colt took all of those ideas that different people had developed and combined them into one manufacturing success. He was able to produce guns in quantities and qualities that had never been imagined before. He did this not for government contract, but for private enterprise. If you've ever been to Hartford, Connecticut, you will understand how much money gun manufacturing made for Colt. He patented and produced his revolver, and you can see in the upper left the revolver taken apart to see how rational those parts are and imagine making them in, in quantities. He advanced production line manufacturing by adding standardized components, interchangeability, and the use of reference surfaces and registrations, and that allowed him by 1865 to make 150 guns a day using 400 specialized machines. So he made a machine to do each operation. Instead of switching out the parts and jigs on one machine, he had banks of machines that were set up to do just one thing each. I know this is a terrible picture at the top. It is the only picture I have ever found of this. And I think you can understand why. There are not a lot of people who care about mid 19th century gauges for manufacturing. But these are all specific gauges that were used to measure distance from a reference point. So you, you attach this to your reference point and you mark out the things you have to do to, there are lots of things being measured here. There's radii, uh, distances, thicknesses, but this is a whole bank of gauges used to produce parts that would be dimensionally identical. And on the bottom you can see a man operating machine that was designed specifically to file the rifle barrel, to run a file down the center of the rifle barrel to true it. That's all that machine does. I should pose just like him. Gauges are so important to the story. They're much better than a drawing. You don't have to understand how to read a drawing or duplicate the measurement. You just copy. But they require real accuracy to make. They require maintenance to take care of. So there are the primary gauges that live locked up in an office. There are the production gauges that are used. These are inspection gauges that someone would use to make sure the parts are still accurate. Because when the production gauges wear out, they need to be replaced. So there are, are at least three layers of gauges involved in creating this level of accuracy. But one of the reasons that's super important is it also allowed standardization between different factories. You could farm out parts and know that they would come back exact. What happened in the 1830s is manufacturers would hire people and train them, engineers would develop these custom machines, and then migrate to other factories. So we started to see the advances that happened in arms manufacturing, which we called armory practice, migrate to other things. And one good example is Pope's Bicycles, the biggest manufacturer of bicycles in America at the time, which was operating out of space rented from the Weed Sewing Machine Factory. So Weed Sewing Machines were made over there, Pope Bicycles were made over there, lots of conversations in between and lots of shared equipment. And the Weed Sewing Machine Factory had been owned by Sharp Rifle Company. So armory practice fed its way through from gun making to sewing machine making to bicycle making and then into car making even later. Gun making is a foundational part of the development of the United States of America. All of our early financial success and independence rested on our ability to make guns. And that may help explain one of the reasons we are having so much trouble shaking this culture of gun ownership. And even just linguistically, think about how hard it is to escape the shadow of gun making. I am blown away by how many gun references there are in English. You set your sights on something, you shoot from the hip, you take a parting shot, something's a long shot, you bite the bullet, you sweat bullets, you take a scattershot approach, you give it your best shot, you're a flash in the pan, you ride shotgun, you stick to your guns, you jump the gun, you go ballistic. You find a silver bullet solution. You say he's a straight shooter, he's a real pistol, he's a little gun shy, he's a hot shot, he's a son of a gun. We should be shooting for next week. Don't shoot the messenger, don't get caught in the crossfire. You're shooting your mouth off, I just can't pull the trigger. She came in with guns blazing. You're going great guns, welcome to the gun show. You should get something in your crosshairs. I know I will come under fire for this. Find a smoking gun, offer a parting shot. Don't shoot yourself in the foot, don't jump the gun. Get some bang for the buck. I don't have a shot in hell, fire away. Don't shoot down other people's ideas. It's just a shot in the dark. I am such a loose cannon, it's like I'm half cocked or something. Anyway. In gun making, the craft pursuit of arms making was transformed into a discipline. 
and the weapon advanced from a shop creation into a factory product, which was a really big migration. The same ideas transformed lots of other manufacturing at the same time. I want to look next at clockmaking, where this transformation is really evident. Eli Terry introduced manufacturing advances into clockmaking. He made wooden clock movements. He didn't make the whole clock they lived in. Other people made that. He made the movements. Wood was an inexpensive material. It's a material that was familiar to most people in America. He could hire farm boys to come in and turn into clockmakers. But he had to redesign the clock to have wider tolerance because wooden gears, unlike metal gears, will move. And so they need to be a little bit sloppier to allow for that. Terry introduced specialized lathes and saws and drills and gear cutters and used gauges and templates and jigs to make accurate, dimensionally stable components. In 1806, he was able to make only about 200 clockworks at a time, but he accepted a contract for 4,000 movements in three years. These huge contracts seem kind of crazy, they just keep falling into people's laps. But if you remember the population explosion, there was a dramatic need for more stuff. He wound up converting his factory to water power, he invented some really cool machinery, and he met that goal. He made 500 clockworks at a time, and he got $4 each for them, which is about $85 today. This is an image of Terry's three spindle gear cutter. On the left, you can see an indexing head. So it's a disc with holes and a, a movable pin. You rotate and pin and rotate and pin, and that advances the cylinder an exact amount, dividing the 360 degrees into whatever you need. And on the right, you can see a cylinder made up of individual discs. So the discs are cut out of wood, they're turned all together on a lathe into a cylinder, then they're put on the spindle cutter, and three cutting heads are run at once back and forth. So each rotation rough cuts a groove, while two other cutters are finished cutting the angled sides of that tooth. So with one rotation, you're cutting endless number of gears exactly the same. That piece of specialized equipment not only removed all the skill from gear making, but it standardized those parts so they were all exactly the same. What Terry introduced was a rational manufacturing system based on armory practice, and we now call that the American system of manufacturing. I want to review what that means because it's a term that I think all designers should know. The American system of manufacturing involves making interchangeable components. So all the parts you make are the same. You make all the parts first, and they're all the same, so then you just put them together. You don't need to fit them. It involves using powered machine tools, introducing reference surfaces, and assembly line method. Make the parts and then assemble. And I struggle to explain that to students because it just is so obvious. But for centuries, we made one part at a time and fit it to the next part. We made one object at a time. Suddenly, we were making multiples and assembling them after. It's the way we've made everything since. There's a book on American manufacturing by David Hounshaw that's quite well known. But what's less known is Donald Hoke's response to that. He was a friend of Hounshaw's and he wrote Ingenious Yankees. And it's a really deep dive into clock making and gun making and standardization. And he has an even briefer definition of the American system of manufacturing. So I want to share that with you. He defines it as the mass production of interchangeable parts on specialized machine tools which I think is a beautiful reduced definition if you already understand the rest of the stuff in there. Let's keep looking at what Terry and others did with the American system. In 1816, he patented the shelf clock. He realized that selling just the works and letting other people make the cases for tall case clocks, for hall clocks, required cabinet makers, it required teamwork. It also had a smaller market of wealthier people. And if he could find a way to miniaturize the clock and standardize it and make it less expensive, he'd have many more customers. If he made the whole clock with the case as well, he could make more profit. Originally, these clocks were $12 each wholesale, which is expensive, about $180 today. So it was a $500 clock. Still, way less expensive than clocks had been. But he was able to get that cost down to a dollar. So Terry is largely responsible for inventing the affordable mantle clock. And think what happens when everyone in America could aspire to own a clock. Before that, it had been an extremely high-end luxury item for kings, for royalty, for the, only the super wealthy. And suddenly anyone can have one. And if you're making the cases for this standardized component inside, 
You could make them in any style you want. You could make it plain and celebrate the insides with a glass front. You could make it Gothic Revival or Greek Revival or Renaissance Revival or Federal. And suddenly, we have the birth of what turned into consumption in America as we still know it. Who am I? My clock will tell you. People could express their ideas and their philosophies and their taste level through their choice of object. And when people came into their house, they would understand more about that person by the clock on the shelf. That shrinking of the mechanism also made it a better clock. This clock could go for 30 hours instead of eight. That's a really big part of good industrial design that we'll look at all semester. Improving the quality of an object, reducing the price, expanding the stylistic offerings, and making it work better. The biggest innovation that Terry introduced to clock making is a really cool one. He realized that the interior movements had two different sort of zones. The sloppy gears that anybody could assemble that had to have some movement for the wood and the really fussy gears that needed to be carefully assembled and carefully adjusted. And he redesigned the clock so the wooden clock plates housed all of the sloppier, looser gears with good tolerances. And then he put the brass escapement mechanism and other really fussy parts on the outside. So the normal assembly line workers could put the clock together and then somebody with a higher skill level and more training would come in and do the final pieces. That also leaves the parts of the clock that might need adjustment or replacing or refining over the life of the clock outside of the assembled components. The other thing he realized was he couldn't fight the movement of the wood. So he reconfigured the interior alignment of the components. The clock plates were oak, which has a fine grain and as little movement as possible in wood and he oriented them vertically. And then he lined up the gears that needed to mesh with each other also vertically, so that as the wood moved along its grain, the gears that had to mesh nicely wouldn't move apart from each other or into each other more. So by changing the interior organization of the components to match the exterior wood situation, he arrived at a better clock. And for me, that's the sign of a really good designer, where you find manufacturing efficiencies that actually improve the product and its functioning. I hope I explained that in a way that makes sense. In a live audience, you can look for scrunched up foreheads and start over. All I've got for feedback is the Brown crew team next door having a kegger. Seth Thomas worked for Terry and eventually bought the factory and introduced the next generation of clock parts. And these are, again, some bad pictures, but the only ones that exist of Seth Thomas's gauges. These are metal profile gauges that you would put up to the metal dowel before you turn it into a pinion. And they have little extensions that mark the wood for where to turn them. They have cutouts that show the right diameter so you can check to see that you've turned it the right amount. So these are all the tools that guaranteed that all those pinions ended up being the same. One of the reasons there aren't better pictures of these things is that nobody wants better pictures of them except me. The other reason is that these tend to live in small historical society collections that aren't digitized, that aren't on the internet. A Google search will never find you a better picture of this. So I'm hoping at some point there's enough funding in the world that small historical societies can digitize their collections. Wouldn't you love to see this picture in color? Yes, you would. The next clock chapter I want to talk about was introduced by Chauncey Jerome. And his arrival coincided with some other advances. By the 1850s, we were using water power to power bigger machinery to make better metal. We could make more refined metal, we could roll it into more even sheet, and we could use water power to power stamps and presses to cut stuff out of that metal. Also, weirdly, in 1837, there was a big depression that coincided with a drop in the price of brass. So Jerome arrived at the right time to take advantage of this whole equation and start making clockworks out of metal. So Jerome introduced stamping to cut out the gears and he was able to make the clockwork even smaller and even more dimensionally stable. By 1841, his company was showing an annual profit of $35,000. That's over $700,000 today, so he was really quickly successful with this. Primarily from the sale of just these brass movements that other people would then put into clocks. There's a famous story of his shipments of 1842 to England. And just think about that even. A wood clock you could never ship to England from America because in the month at sea it would expand and contract and everything would fall apart. 
a metal clock you can ship overseas. So suddenly there's intercontinental trade in this product. And when his 1842 order arrived in Britain, the customs officers saw the, the manifest and thought, there's no way this many clocks could cost this little money. Someone's trying to get around paying duty. So we'll confiscate the clocks, we'll sell them at full market value. We're just gonna pay this guy this paltry amount on the invoice. So then the customer complained they didn't get their clocks. Jerome sent another batch, it happened again. The third shipment that came, the customs officers realized there's something in this. They must actually be making these clocks for that little. So that got Britain and then the rest of Europe interested in what was going on in America, how these things were being made, how this American system of manufacturing had realized the promise of standardization. Anyone who's worked with sheet metal knows that when you have thin metal and you cut it and it stays flat, it wiggles all over the place. Jerome conquered this by introducing three-dimensional texturing to the metal, dimples and embossed rings. So if you look at this picture on the left, you can see on the gears there's sort of a concentric ring where the metal's raised up. That's not added on, it's stamped in. When you've got thin sheet metal that's flat and essentially two-dimensional, and you introduce a three-dimensional change to it by bending or stamping, you get rigidity. By 1850, Jerome was making 300,000 clockworks a year. They cost 50 cents to make and he sold them for $1.50. That's about $13 today. But that's a really healthy profit for a manufacturer to triple their cost. And these metal geared smaller works lasted longer on one wind. They lasted eight days instead of 30 hours. So in one generation of clocks, we went from, from eight hours to 30 hours to eight days, which is pretty amazing. You probably don't even know what winding a clock means. You just look at your device and it tells you the time. If you have a clock that needs winding, it has to be part of your daily routine or you lose track of what time it is. Every Sunday, I wind my clock. And so this progress keeps snowballing and combining. What we saw in one generation of clock making transformed clocks from this elitist craft into a mass manufacturing industry. Think about what that's gonna do. The American system of manufacturing changed a lot of things. It led to trade, it created industry, it developed manufacturing, which created wealth. And not just a little wealth, a lot of wealth. And that wealth was in new places. Anybody who figured out a system could arrive at wealth. And that created a mingling of social classes in America that wasn't as possible in Europe. Social mobility in America was actually attainable. The American system of manufacturing led to the idea of the American dream that's still alive today. This idea that if you work hard, you'll get somewhere. I think in today's world, it's way less true, but you can, I hope, appreciate how that development happened. And isn't it funny that the American dream is not happiness or contentment, it's business success only? And that also speaks to what was happening at this era as we forced industrialization and the consumption of natural resources on the continent, whether the people who lived here wanted it or not. So we have to look at what all this new manufacturing and wealth and social mobility did in the United States. It was true globally, but it's really easy to see play out in the United States. The world had been for centuries, mostly the same. The way we lived on the world didn't change it. We were agrarian, we were need-based, our transportation was non-invasive. So you wheel your stuff in a cart on a road and when that road ends at the water, you transfer your stuff onto a boat and it goes across the water. But our footprint wasn't all that visible. Our population had grown over the centuries, but it had grown pretty steadily. If we just look at New York City, and there's a beautiful image of it to give you a sense of scale, in 1800, there were 60,000 people living in New York City. By 1830, 30 years later, that was way up. It was up to 200,000. By 1850, it was up to 500,000. So it's growing really rapidly, but it is growing steadily in a sort of straight line curve. But look what happens right after this era of figuring out industrialization. In 1870, there were almost a million people living in New York City. And in 1900, there were three and a half million people. So the curve turns crazy exponential. Is that a math term, crazy exponential? So now we're building bridges we're building high rises, we're using steel, we're totally changing the built world to suit our industrialized needs. And this is a totally global narrative. Population growth is really interesting to look at. In 1500, there were 500 million people on the planet. In 1600, there were 600 million people on the planet. Guess how many there were in 1700? 
700 million people. Guess how many there were in 1800? 800 million people. So you see the pattern here, right? Linear. More people, but predictable. But by 1900, there were 1600 million people. Population doubled because we could farm more, because we could produce more, because we had more medicine. There's lots and lots of reasons that our population could expand like that. And we'll look at that more when we look at farming and the Industrial Revolution. But it is definitely also spurred by this ability to produce more stuff more easily. Remember that cities were industrial hubs. The picture on the lower left is New York City. That's Exchange Place. So when you go to New York City now and go to Soho, it's a tourist attraction, it's an anthropology, it's high-end retail. But remember that all those buildings were once factories. It was a very different place. And that's true globally. The top picture is Fall River, the lower right is Manchester. So that's the American system of manufacturing. A really important development to keep in mind as we look all semester at how designers created things to be manufactured. Because without that separation of the making from the conception, we wouldn't have design as a profession. Next week, we're going to plunge into examining the technologies that allowed and grew out of the Industrial Revolution. We're going to look at how power sources extended the narrative of commerce and industry and wealth and social change, but also how the ancient technologies that I talked about last week got power sources attached, combined with each other to really transform our options and the whole world as a result. But there are a couple of chapters I want to include first. Week two, part two is the Shakers, an American religious sect that did some pretty amazing things. People who know about the Shakers will wonder why they're in an industrial design history class. People regularly wonder if they're part of the story of industrialization. I believe that they are because it is easy to understand industrialization by looking at people who were working at the time it was starting and examining that conversation in a more meaningful way than some other people who were just charging forward making money. Also, they were champion class problem solvers really inspiring to designers who are interested in the challenge of identifying and solving problems. They also produced incredible information graphics. So week two, part two, the shakers. Week two, part three is Josiah Wedgwood for a lot of reasons. And one of my main accomplishments in my brief time here on this planet is that I have gotten hundreds of 18 and 19 year olds to think that some dude from the 18th century was really cool. Also in class, there are usually short student presentations taking on a variety of topics that relate to the lectures, and we're not doing those this year. So I'm going to try to put together a little mini chapter on transportation and power sources, because when you find out what we did with humans and horses and donkeys and dogs, before we did stuff with water and steam and coal and electricity and nuclear power, uh, I think you'll be amazed. So I wanna try and get that done as well. That's part one done. Take a break, have some ice cream, do some jump roping, and tune back in for part two. I put my mouse in my pocket and taped over the optical sensor so I can just press forward and back and you don't even know I'm doing it. Progress. Eli Terry introduced motorcycle break. It's Saturday night and I'm on my motorcycle. Make a noise, bothering people. Eli Terry